And there's a state of play in the leaderboards. We can see that with four players left, three players get paid, but the real prize is that top spot, giving you a $25,000 entry to the Monte Carlo Millions and a shot at winning that half a million first prize. Andrew and John both up there with very similar chips, but they've got there through very different routes. John played fewer pots, Andrew getting himself involved. And the dynamic is changing all the time. A pair of tens in a small blind for Tim. Timmy calls. Andrew. Andrew passes. OK, before the flop, Amir has gone all in and he's been called by Tim. We've got a pot of 10,200. Let's see your cards, guys. Amir wasn't looking for a call. It was a straightforward steal there with those suited connectors. And he's gutted. He was hoping to see something like sevens, but tens. He's a long, long way behind now. Needs trips. Make a straight. Going to be difficult with the tens out. Or, of course, that diamond flush. Deuce. Eight. Eight. Wow! Trips. It's a great pot for him here. Let's face that. He's not out of the woods yet, though. See the turn. Twenty-six. Tim and stays alive. And Tim was brutalised by that flop. Always played poker over the years, played with mates, and about five or six years ago, once I stopped working, got into it a bit more, read about it, and started playing um, home games, and then progressed to places like the Gut Shop, where I play now. The biggest tournament I entered would have been a £500 buy-in tournament, and I think I got knocked out in about 15 minutes. <laughs> Did well. The longest game I've ever played in um, was a home game that went on for nearly two days. My favourite starting hand is 6-7, um, mainly because it busts the big hands if it hits. But I suppose my favourite player is the Devilfish. Um, I think he's probably one of the best no-limit players out there and certainly got the uh, best line on wit and repartee at the table. I play mainly for enjoyment and it keeps me out of the pubs, so I don't really have a great ambition just to enjoy myself at the table. <laughs> It keeps you out of the pub. Well, that's the line you use with your girlfriend or your mother every time she complains about you playing poker. Tim's a retired money broker. He knows you've got to speculate to accumulate. And 6-7, that's his favourite hand. That's a bit of a long shot, that hand. Tim moves all in. He's all in. 4,000 exactly. That's a big, big move there. John says call. Too easy to call for John. Passes. 3,700 to you, John. Okay, before the flop, Tim has moved all in. He's been called by John for a pot of 86. Let's see your hands, fellas. Guys, quid. John's ahead of the pair of <laughs> Tim's got queen two. Enough? Need a little bit of help. Tim has got to hit his queen, unless he makes that miracle flush. Okay, run it. Run He's flop. looking at about 32-33% for his outdraw. Ace. Ten. No help yet. No help so far, John. Two possible runner-runner combinations for a straight, the top end or the bottom end. Couple of spades. Ten to seven. Still no help. John thinks he's going to push him out. He's dead. He's dead. And John takes out another player. Tim must be gutted. So I went out with a pretty weak hand, a rubbishy old queen. Um, it was suited, but that doesn't make much difference. But I was decimated the hand before against Amir. I had a pair of tens against his 9-8, and he flopped 3-8s. Um, 
and that left me with about 3,000 chips. And with the blinds at 3.6, it's 9,000 around. Uh, not, yeah, sorry, 900 around with um, four players. So I basically have to move now and try and get some chips. I know I'm going in with the worst hand. If I get called, I need to get lucky to double up to get back in the game. So it's just something you you have to do. Um, it's horrible when you hear that fateful call. You know you're behind, but um, that's the way it goes. And John had a pair of nines and quite rightly won the pot. I had a few playable hands, um, a few hands I'd like to have played where I was in early position but didn't think they were worth it and uh, when I passed them there were, um, there were raises behind me so I think I overall probably did the right thing. Okay guys, three of you left, congratulations you've all made the money but who's got that little bit extra to win? Let's find out, the blinds are four and eight now, shuffle up and deal. Okay, a mere small blind, 400. Blinds have crept up, but more to the point now, there's only three of them left. And they're going to be making all sorts of moves at this stage. It's less important what you've got in your hand than what your opponent has got in his. And Amir has gone all in. Andrew passes. Amir wins a pot of 1,200. Shows ace-king. No resistance. And he shows his big hand there. He's trying to maintain an image of tightness so players will be loath to call him. He's more interested in having them fold than taking it to a showdown now. All about survival. John's picked up the threes. It's a hand of sorts. He's out of position. He's flat called there against Amir. He's declined to bully him. And he's not likely to connect with the three. Let's see if he's prepared to make a move on the flop if he misses. Ace, four, and an eight. John. Well, Amir's connected. Check, check. John now behind. Amir. Ten cards and ace. Not check. confident that his opponent isn't trapping with an ace. That's a thousand. John calls. And it's difficult to take that bet seriously from Amir because if he had an ace, it's likely he would have bet it before the flop. Two cards is seven. Checks. Check. Shows aces and, eights. and John read it right. His opponent didn't have the ace, but unfortunately pairs, he connected with the eight. So Amir takes yeah, another 600. one. Flat moves. Well, there's a leaderboard. You can see there's a clear low man. If this were a normal tournament, then John and Andrew might be disinclined to get involved with each other, both hoping to see their opponent get knocked out, but with that top-heavy price structure, that shot at the Monte Carlo Millions, they may as well acquire the chips they're going to need right now from each other. Welcome back to London's Poker Bowl. If you've just joined us, we are down to three from our initial field of six with two players well up in the front there, John and Andrew, both poker room managers, and Amir trailing behind for that big Monte Carlo Millions prize. Cool under pressure, Amir Dowd. Queen suited. That's a big hand at this stage of the game, not least because with so few players there's a good chance you'll get action from a worse ace. Well, John made the move with absolutely nothing. Just trying to bully his opponent. And Amir knows he'll be beating most hands that would make that move. Doesn't think twice about chucking it all in. Again, Amir shows his big hand. He wants his opponent's folding. And John Iono caught with his fingers in the till. 
is 400, John is 800. He's picked it up again. A screen not suited this time, but it really doesn't matter. Oh, Andrew passes. John passes. Shows a screen again. Coming from the. And once again, maintaining that tight reputation, showing his cards. That's your big blind, me. John, you have a small blind. Onwards and upwards. I got my poker nickname because uh, I'm a dental student, so I thought it'd be quite a funny one to have. I've not been playing very long actually, poker. Um, I started about three months ago, um, just with some friends at home, and gradually progressed, and now I play almost every day. I play more live games now, and when I first started I used to play a bit more online, but gradually moved to more live games. The biggest tournament I won was a 50 freeze-out, and I came first. Um, I also won a 30 freeze out about a week ago. Uh, my favourite starting hand, the sort of the suited connectors, possibly Jack 10, Queen 10. Poker's player's greatest asset is knowing when he's beat and when to lay down a hand. There's quite a few people on the table that I'll be watching out for. Um, probably everyone, to be quite honest with you. Possibly Tim, especially. A modest man. But he's back up to the best part of 18,000, so he's well back in this game. John. John calls. Any raise on me? No raise. Okay, two way action. Pot is 1,600. Flop. Three. Ace. Queen. John. Check. Both players miss. Amir, however, has got that flush draw. Turn card to nine. John. There it is. Amir bets 1,000. Small bet trying to keep John interested. John frustrates his attempts to draw him in. Flush takes it. And there's no stopping this man. on the button. He's not interested in pushing his luck with Jack Five. We've not seen Andrew do much in the way of bluffing. Now would not be a good time with John sitting there with two pair. John's trying to draw him in. But now he's got to worry that Andrew's tripped up there with the ace. But John knows he's ahead now. Andrew would bet the ace for sure if he had trips. And John bets out, hoping that Andrew will read him for a bluff, representing an ace. He's got aces and jacks. Oh, load of nothing. John shows a pair of aces and jacks. Andrew's got the king high. Andrew hoping his king kicker John was good. And I really feel John now is starting to really take control of this game. You can see that he's clearly in the lead, moving ahead of both Andrew and Amir. And he's going to be bullying them all the way to Monte Carlo.
here's a little board for tonight's poker bowl and Amir, who for so long has been the low man, is now knocking on the door there of Andrew, about to move up into second place and have a shot at taking out John Iano's hopes for that Monte Carlo prize. Conscious of the fact that his stack has waned. John passes. 400 to me. 10 9 in the small blind, worth a steal perhaps? And your raises. That's a nice raise, putting Andrew under pressure. Three thousand nine hundred. More. Cool. That's a loose call with the king five. Does Andrew think he's ahead, or is he planning to make a move on the flop if Amir checks? Seems quite loose to me. Let's see what the flop brings. Oh dear. Well, if this pushes Andrew off the king, it will be a fantastic bluff, but I don't think it's going to. That was a one card Amir didn't want to see. Given that that's exactly what Andrew's got in his hand, and he really can't fold this now, having called. I can't believe he's really dwelling up here seriously. He must call this his played for a raise before the flop is connected with his king. And let's face it, Amir would make exactly that same move as a bluff, or indeed, if he had something like a pair of tens or a pair of nines, he'd still make that move. Okay, on a flop of king 4-3, Amir has moved all in, and he's been called by Andrew for a pot of 34-8, uh, and the biggest pot of the night. Let's see the cards, guys. Amir is hoping to see that his opponent has paired the four or the three that leaves him two over cards. What he's hoping not to see is exactly that Andrew's king. Got a pair of kings. Amir will need some help to survive. And Nick Wealthall understates the case there when he says that Amir needs help. And the turn. He's dead. And Amir can't win. Well, my sympathies are with Amir there. He established his table image, he made his move, he received a loose call from the king, and it just happened to connect. Well, uh, it's been a bit silly, to be honest with you. I didn't need to make a move. Well, I raised it. He's called me, and I should have just checked the flop. Instead, I go all in. He's got a king. There you go. When it goes down to three, I'm, I'm coming back. I'm short stacked. I have to, I have to start trying to nick some pots. And luckily, I had some very nice hands. And then uh, got a bit greedy. And got caught out. Yeah. The reason I show cards is so that when I make a move like that, they think I'm being serious, so they gain a bit of respect, so that they know I'm not bluffing. But uh, when I did bluff, I got caught. <laughs> Happens. Well, here we are. Heads up. Blinds now 500, 1,000. And in heads up play, the button is the small blind. That means the button, the dealer, is first to act before the flop Jump. and then last to act afterwards. A pair of sevens for John. Right. Pocket pairs have been good to him tonight. Cool. And 
Andrew calls. He's going to be out of position on the flop. He's not got much of a hand there. Even less so, given that his seven is held twice over by John. He's got to hit the nine. Or, indeed, make a straight. He's picked up his straight draw there. And a draw is a big hand in heads-up play. Probably John doesn't have a queen. And having called before the flop, Andrew could credibly have one, so he's putting pressure on John. And this is the trouble with pocket pairs. Once they're behind, they tend to stay behind. John knows that if he perseveres with this pot, he's got to be prepared to go all the way through. He has called. And I can't help feeling he'll surrender this if his opponent bets again on the turn. John hoping his opponent won't bet and provide him with a difficult decision. And Andrew's draw is now one card further away. He's got to make it on the river. He's worse than one in five now. To make things worse for him, the queen on the board there means he can't make the nut straight, but he's happy to carry on with his draw. He knows that's a strong, confident bet, having bet the flop and the turn. He knows that's got a good chance of working. And it's going to be very difficult for John to call here. He's got the best hand, but... He just doesn't know where he is. Today, Andrew has been more of a caller than a better. And John's trying to work out whether he's really got a hand or he's just changed his spots because of the heads-up situation. And the longer John thinks, the more likely he is to fold. Trying to pick up a towel off his opponent there. Well, it looks like he's found one. He's called. Okay, the pot is now 31,000. And they're both very deep into this pot now. Half of the chips in the middle. There was a king. More yeah. worries for John. Even if his opponent was bluffing, he couldn't have connected with that king. Has Andrew got the guts to push this through right to the end? He knows with John so short stacked, it's easy for John to call with a marginal hand such as the one he has, in fact, the sevens. But if John was drawing, Andrew checks, John checks. he might be prepared John to put sevens. it down. And John has felt his way very delicately through that hand, being asked to play for a vast amount of chips. The hand was good at the top of the show. It ended at the top of the show. And Andrew just with a failure of nerve there to push the bluff through at the bitter end. In fact, I think John would probably have called. And John has patiently moved himself up into the lead over the course of the game, fell briefly behind there to Andrew when he took out Amir with that lucky, lucky king. But now John is back where he feels that he belongs. Instead of play in tonight's heat of the London Poker Bowl, John Ayanu has a 2-1 chip lead over his opponent, 
How is he going to play it? Is he going to try and whittle him down, or will he be looking to set him all in and take him out with a better hand, or a lucky outdraw? I've always been playing poker, home games, family games, friends, developing into casinos. In the tournaments that I've played, I've played about 300 tournaments. I've made the final one, one in five on an average. Everybody thinks I'm a tight player. I can be very tight. I can plot, not play a hand for hours. Uh, then again, I can re-raise you with five deuce. I like to sit in seat three or seat seven. I like to have, look across and see everybody at the table. There's only one starting hand for me, and that's pocket aces. Uh, I do like, obviously, the five deuce. We call it the uh, powerhouse, um, basically, because I've, I've won quite a bit of money with the five deuce. And I sometimes play it like aces, um, limping in an early position, somebody raises, I'll re-raise representing a big hand, sometimes they put a big hand down to me and I'll show them the five deuce and we have a good, good laugh about it. I've been playing poker for about uh, two years, started on the internet uh, where I had quite a lot of success, got into it originally through uh, sports betting, which is a big pastime of mine. Last year I qualified for a poker cruise in the Mediterranean, for a competition uh, with uh, three quarters of a million dollars in prize money. At the time it was the first time I'd ever played live poker. Um, so whilst I didn't do particularly well in the tournaments, it gave me a real buzz and has fired my enthusiasm for the live game since then. The biggest pot I ever lost was a £3,000 tournament which I played on the internet. It was got down to me and another guy for the £3,000 prize. Uh, I had uh, a pair of kings, he had a pair of jacks. One of the other players had already announced that he'd folded a jack. The cards came down blank, 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 jack, which uh, gave him the first prize. My favourite starting hand is a pair of tens. Um, for some reason I've noticed when I've been playing with that hand, it, obviously it's, you know, part of the random nature of cards, but I seem to hit sets with it more often. And I also think it's a hand that I can get away from a bit easier if I don't hit my set, whereas something like jacks or queens, I can be lured into putting in an awful lot of money into a pot, which ultimately I'm going to lose. Well, there they are, two very different characters here, our finalists in this heat of the Monte Carlo Millions Poker Bowl competition. And interesting there that John Granite, I don't know, is the first player to admit to having aces as his favourite hand. He does say that sometimes he'll bet it up with five deuce, pretending it's aces, and you'll be left wondering which ones he's got. Three diamonds on the flop would set the cat amongst the pigeons here. And there's the pair for Andrew and the up and down straight draw for John. John's checked it. Well, that's certainly small enough for him to call. He's got eight outs. No help for either. Again, doesn't want to semi bluff with the draw. Three cards of three. John. John bets three thousand. John's seen a weak bet, a weak looking bet from Andrew on the flop, and then a check on the turn. He thinks his opponent's got nothing. In fact, Andrew has the better hand. When he makes a good call, he realises that in heads-up play, his opponent can easily bet with nothing and would often be right too. Good call. Well, they're very different personalities, these two. John is very much the moody poker player there, and he's the last representative of the gut shot contingent fighting it out against Andrew, the interloper. 
he might have been concerned that uh, possibly the other gut shot players would soft play each other and push him out. But from my experience of the gut shot, that's hardly likely to be the case. And uh, he's taken a number of scalps and put his chips in, followed the courage of his convictions. And although he may look uncertain, I've got a feeling he's still a contender. <coughs> Pocket pair versus over cards. John knows it's unlikely his opponent has a pocket pair, so the fours are probably ahead. He also knows that he's going to be in position when that flop comes down and can exploit any weakness that Andrew shows. Well, he's not showing weakness before the flop. And it's come straight back at him. And now John's got to worry. If the fours are ahead, they're not going to be ahead by much. And if he's up against a higher pocket pair, he really doesn't want to be in this pot. And again, John's got slightly puzzled. How dare you look on his face? Do you know who I am? Just trying to create some nerves in Andrew. Even if he has to let this one go. The longer he makes Andrew wait, the less likely he will be to make a move on him in the future. Andrew's picked up the weak ace again, this time John with much the inferior hand. That's a dangerous flop when two players have chosen not to raise it up. John calls, it's 5,000 in the pot. John calls with the up and down straight draw. Turn cards and ace, Andrew. It's not there, it makes two pair for Andrew, but he has got a worry that John might have been sitting there with the deuce looking for the straight at the other end. Three thousand is big enough to push John off this. His chance of making the straight is less than one in five. He's not getting those odds from the pot. John passes. And he can only put John the chips in if he's reasonably confident that he can make Andrew pay him at the end if he makes his straight. But if John does make his straight there, it's kind of screaming out to everyone from the board, and he knows that. Andrew won't necessarily pay him, so he makes the correct fold. Interesting there that Andrew played the two aces very differently on each hand. On the first time he got them, he actually raised John. Second time he got them, he just decided to check them. It looked like he'd put John on not much of a hand the first time and decided to take the pot there and then. Second time he didn't know where John was, decided he'd rather see the flop. Three, seven. John must be feeling he needs to get back into this game. He's got a better hand here. And John has foregone the opportunity to have a nick at that. Two checks from your opponent normally means no hand. But there was, of course, a possibility that Andrew was trapping. And John could take it to the end if that was not the case and show the best hand. Very touch and go at this stage. In a full handed game, you pick up some hands and you say, I'm not interested in this, and you stop thinking about it. He 
and heads up, every single hand is a potential winner. Turn eight versus ten eight. John Coulter, any raise out? No raise. No raise? Okay, so four thousand. The blinds have gone up now, they're one thousand, two thousand. Jack. King. Out of eight. Andrew. Both players connect. Two scary overcards there though. John Bets three. John knows that his opponent is less likely to have connected with the jack or the king cool. than to have connected with it, and he'll be very, very suspicious about that call. With those high cards there, Andrew's not going to call with nothing. And John has got to worry that he's holding the king and looking for John to keep betting into him. 9-10. Also a possibility that either player could be holding, making the straight there. It looks like John has decided Four. to give up this pot. Andrew. Which means that Andrew could push him off it if he wants. 4,000. Andrew bets 4,000. And that's an interesting bet. Is he trying to bluff? Or is he betting for value, hoping that John will call him with a worst hand? <laughs> John calls. <laughs> Amazing eight stuff. 810. 810. Split pot. Well, there's a leaderboard. Two players are still in it, and John Ayanu's lead is slipping down. He's trying to control his opponent, but finding it much harder than he was expecting. Andrew's still definitely in this game. Welcome back to tonight's Heat of London's Poker Bowl. The winner of this game sits down in the Poker Bowl final, and the winner of that goes off and sits down in the Monte Carlo Millions and gets a shot at that half a million first prize. 1,000 Andrew, 2,000 John. Blinds are 1,000, 2,000. These players each started off with just 10,000. And uh, the 3,000 in blinds constitutes... 20th of all the chips in play. Raise. And renounces the raise. Raise of 5,000. Raises 5,000. Andrew's raising into an ace. Suited ace, moreover. John will be out of position on the flop. And he knows that in principle he's got to risk all his chips to get involved here. And in fact he goes all in, makes the decision easier for himself. Doesn't want to be exploited on the flop out of position. And if he's going to play the hand, I think that's probably much the best way to play it. And he said it himself, it was an excellent raise. John could be sitting on something like 10-9 suited, but more likely than not, Andrew's queen is behind. And once John had put himself all in, Andrew would have had no room to manoeuvre on the flop. At that stage, it just comes down to the actual match-up. And in that situation, Andrew is about a 2-1 to one dog. Andrew, 
this time. John's got the suited queen. Of course, any race, John. Yeah, no race. Okay, it's a pot of 4,000. Andrew just limps in with 9 7, Four. looking to connect. Four, ace, and a five. John? Check. Andrew? Check. John just seemed very confident there with that check. It King. had a nice look of strength about it. I think Andrew picked up on that, decided not to have a shot at the pot. They're both checking it down. River pod. Ten. Still no connection for either player. Check. Nothing. Queen high. Nothing is good on this occasion. John shows queen high. Nothing beats Andrew nothing. Nine high. John's going to win a pot of 4,000. John's a small blind for 1,000. Andrew, your big blind for 2,000. Well, these two have been battling it out for some time now. Both players seem to be fairly calm under fire. And the blinds will be rising fairly soon. And there are two hands that can both be played. Quite happily in a heads up game. An ace versus suited high connectors. Here's your flop. It's a seven, a five. Queen hits. John's going to want to bet this to push out the flush draw. He's gone all in. He's made his decision. He's got a pair. He's relatively short stacked. On a board of Queen 7 5, Andrew's moved all in. He's been called by John. We've got 35,000 in the pot, and Andrew must win the hand, or John is our winner. Let's have a look at the cards, lads. Andrew, Andrew shows a pair seven. of sevens. John has a pair of queens and is ahead. Andrew's got five outs. Two remaining sevens, three aces. That makes him worse than three to one to get himself out of this. No one's got a spade. See the turn, perhaps. There's our spade could be split. Cards the king. Andrew still needs to hit an ace or a seven. Or, chill, or a spade for a split. John knows how close he is. And the river. The river is a deuce. The deuce, no help, and John is our winner. Well, no, John Ione who takes it. Well played. Well played, James. Well played, John. Thank well, in the end, it yeah. came down to pair versus pair. I and John had the right end of it. Mm. Well, I had uh, a seven. The flop came down uh, queen five seven, so I had middle pair. Uh, but there were three spades on the flop, so I thought I might be able to force John off the hand by uh, re-raising him all in. Uh, he had top pair with his uh, jack kicker, uh, so he, he wasn't fooled by that. He was he raised me well and uh, called. No help on turn or river, and uh, I'm sat here in runners up chair. It was pretty cagey. I think that was um, partly due to the fact that earlier on in the game, I'd managed to get um, quite a few chips by uh, calling, essentially I'd sort of think up top pair or whatever, and I felt some of the other players were trying to push me off hands. And there was certainly on one occasion when I uh, laid down um, an ace on the flop, um, when I think John indeed had 5-2, um, uh, so he a total bluff pushed me, pushed me off the hand. Um, but other times, uh, I players tried it on with bluffs on me and I pulled them down and so I think John possibly thought of when we got to heads up um, that he wasn't going to try very much on um, and so again I was playing quite passively as well so that ended up with a lot of checking. Uh, there were certainly a couple of hands which were checked right down when neither of us had a hand but at the same time neither of us had a, a pop at the pot. Early on in the, uh, in the game I was getting some quite good hands um, and certainly the the uh, hand with Hugh when I hit a set of fives on the turn and he went all in on me. Uh, that, was a, that was a big turning point in the game for me um, because I mean, he, was, he was a very good player and uh, to take him out and get his chips was, was a real boom. Um, and that really you know, set me up. All the way through the rest of the game from that, it was sort of myself and John who were the two chip leaders. Indeed, at one stage, I think we had equal stacks. Um, so I suspected it might be me and him that ended up heads up. The last hand I had Queen Jack of Hearts. Uh, I think I flat called on the button. Uh, ball came out Queen High, all spades. Uh, he checked. 
I bet it. He's re-raised me. I don't have him on a flush. I think he might be flushing. Might have the ace of spades or something like that. Read him wrong actually. I think he had a pair in the end, didn't he? A pair of sevens. Was it ace seven or something like that? So when he's gone all in, I've called him. I felt I was winning. I thought, mate, he might be drawing, but I felt that I was winning. I played quite a few heads ups, and I do like to play KG affairs. I don't. I'm not an all in before the flop with, with any old ace. I like to play the flop. I like to try and read the player. Um, I felt I knew when he had a strong hand and when he didn't have a strong hand. When I had the pair of sevens against him and, and flat called him a couple of times, I didn't think he was that strong and he was drawing, so I, I, that was an important pot for me, that put me in the lead. And once I was in the lead, I was determined not to you know, let the lead go. Let's have a look now at one of our more unusual hands of the night. And this is an example of what can happen when pots aren't raised before the flop. We've got Artie here on the button. He's short stacked. And we've got Andrew on his left, who isn't. Both players have shown a propensity to enter pots. And the same can be said of Hugh Curtin on the big blind. Artie comes in here with 9-7 suited, which is a hand you do want to play in position. And that's where he is. It's cheap for Andrew. He comes in also with 5-7 suited. And flop helps no one. But with three players in the pot, no one is prepared to try and bluff at this point. And here's a seven. Now two players are connected. Andrew, Jack, Hugh, checks. Artie, thousand. Bet's a thousand. Artie bet's small. He's got to worry that someone may have been sitting on a ten. And this is the signal that Andrew is giving out. Andrew's also got the seven. As far as he's concerned, he's betting in good faith. But to Artie, it looks like he's been trapped. Hugh immediately re releases his cards. And Artie, yeah. we can see, is sitting there with uh, the raise. best seven <laughs> and the best hand. Uh, of 2000. But it's a difficult bet to call. At this stage, it's all about reading your opponent. And I was surprised here at his final decision. But you can see what he says in a minute. He has a good old think. He's trying to put his opponent on either a representation of the 10 or indeed the 10 itself, the business. Tries to pick up a tail. I think he's having a little covert look at his opponent's body language there. Somebody's got to do it. Re -raise and there it is. He makes a speech play. Artie goes all in. It's another 1,300 more. He's implying he's not got much, which indeed is what two, ten, he has, seven, not much. Six. Artie's moved all in. He's been called by Andrew for a pot of 9,800. Guys, let's see. And at this point, Artie the pot is so big that Andrew can call. Pair of seven, he probably nine, thinks he's behind. He is behind. But when two players five. are playing with small hands like that, what can way. often happen is that the pot is split. And in this case, we see a split if either there's a high card or exactly what happens there. The board the pairs up again, giving split. themselves, Both giving each of them uh, a full house there. And Artie survives. <laughs> but a big call, or rather a big raise from Artie there. And that set the tone of his game. <laughs> okay, nice and friendly. Well, we'll be seeing John Ayanu again in the final. You've been listening to commentary from Dr Tom. And I sincerely hope you've enjoyed watching these players on the road to Monte Carlo.